Hi, John. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm pretty good. And you? I'm doing fine. We established in our pre-game banter that you're well rested because you t you wisely took an over-the-counter uh, sleeping pill, which I d I failed to do, and I didn't sleep well at all. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, well, I um, I think you should it, try. We should say it's about 8 a.m. when we're doing this. Yeah, I think you should try. Uh, you should try what I try. I don't take one every night, but um, every now and then, if I feel like I'm I'm uh, not getting enough sleep. I take uh, an over-the-counter remedy like Simply Sleep or Somonex. I take a half dose, and it's just enough so that if I get up to take a leak in the middle of the night, which I almost always have to do at my age, um, I fall right back to sleep instead of staying up and obsessing about something that I have to write or how I haven't graded uh -huh. my student papers yet and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, can, you know, give it a try. Yeah, I think I won't actually. Well, because well, but... you know, Bob, I've noticed in some of these, um, some of these floggy heads things, uh, and, and actually this influenced me this morning. Uh, I decided not to shower and shave, and I noticed that that you often look like you haven't showered and shaved, and uh, and now I realize that you're also a little sleep deprived, and and um, and it, it's things. all it's all falling into place, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But, um. Anyway, just just think about it. Somonex, simply sleep. Thank you. I still remember the the Somonex theme song from the like late sixties, early seventies. Do you remember that? No, I didn't know there was such a thing. Take Somonex tonight and sleep. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> Safe and restful sleep, sleep, sleep. Jesus, you should at least get some one of those little. They so, should send me one free for that, damn it. Yeah, they should give you... we got to do more product placement on blogging. Yeah, there. definitely. They should have one of those little sidebar uh, ads for uh, for the opening segment here. Yeah. Okay, but enough about you. <laughs> um, the uh, So this is, uh, uh, you know, one thing, one of the main things I wanted to talk to you about is this book that you're apparently working on that has something to do with the hoped-for end of war, mm -hmm. not end of any particular war that we're in right now, but war in general. Um, and I've heard you allude to this in your conversations with George Johnson on Blogging Heads. By the way, we should say that you're John Horgan and I'm Bob Wright. Right. Uh, and, um, the, uh, and, and I've never, I've always felt that if I knew more about your project, I could muster some skepticism <laughs> or withering criticism, but I never feel I know, which I would love to, to direct toward you, withering criticism, but... I, I never feel as if I can quite get a handle on it based on what you've said. So maybe you can um, tell me more about your project. I think, Bob, that yeah. uh, that we're in sync on this. I know that um, you, as I recall, have written about the end of war yourself as I a have. result of uh, the increase in non-zero-sum interactions, and we're all headed toward this big kumbaya in the sky and that sort of thing. And that's the big wait, big what in the sky? What what is it I'm hoping for? Big kumbaya in the sky. Oh, big kumbaya. Yes, yeah. I have I have specifically envisioned a big kumbaya in the sky. Yes. A big love fest. Um, 2012, I think, is my prediction. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, my interest in this actually goes back to uh, right at the beginning of the. Um, U.S. invasion of Iraq, and a, a priest in my hometown asked me to give a talk on whether war is in our genes. Every, everybody was obviously really worried about what was going to, going to happen in Iraq, and uh, when I, I started talking to people, and I realized that, that um, there was a lot of, of kind of depressed pessimism over the prospects for getting, getting rid of war in general. And I had, back at least in the 80s, in those wonderful Clinton years, uh, the end of the Cold War, I had thought that, um, that we were headed toward a world without war. Then 9-11 happened, Afghanistan, the invasion of Iraq. And then I gave this talk at, um, at this church, St. Philip's Church in Garrison. And actually, I, I did a bunch of research for it, and I, I read uh, Richard Wrangham, the Harvard anthropologist who uh, wrote a book called Demonic Males, which argues that war is, is a very uh, ancient and innate uh, behavior. I read a book by uh, the uh, anthropologist Lawrence Keeley, which said that 
humans. Well, it's called War Before Civilization, is that right? War Before Civilization, which is... I, I think that's a really good book. It's a, so, so you're probably going to say it's not or something. Oh, I, I think actually it is a very good book. I just think its implications have been grossly overstated. But when I... Well, yeah, but not by him. No, not by him. Um, although I think in certain places... Well, well let, me, let me just provide a little context for this. So what I, what I wanted to say is that in, in 2003, when I gave this talk, uh, after reading Richard Wrangham and Keeley, I concluded that war probably is innate and goes all the way back to the common ancestor with chimpanzees, which is what uh, Wrangham had said. Um, and uh, you know, so that, that, that's uh, millions of years old uh, because Wrangham uh, in Demonic Males reported evidence of... Uh, chimpanzees forming little raiding parties and beating the hell out of and, and killing chimpanzees from other troops. Chimpanzees are our closest relatives, so that was very disturbing. Keeley in his book documents how um, among a lot of these very uh, simple tribal societies like the Yanomamo, uh, Plains Indians, some hunter-gatherer groups, there is fierce fighting. So it totally blows away the old Rousseauian myth of the noble savage. So right. I presented that evidence in my talk and I said, look, this, this, this looks pretty bad, but still um, we have to believe that we can get rid of war. And then I took a poll at the end of, the, um, at the end of my little talk and uh, asked the people in the audience, there are maybe, I don't know, 40 or 50 people in the audience. And these, of course, are good liberal doves, um, uh, typical of this, uh, this area. And I said, how many of you think that war will end someday? And I expected to get a pretty optimistic response. Almost overwhelmingly, people said war will never end. Mm -hmm. They ruled out the possibility of war ending. And I felt that I had kind of been to blame for that because I presented this, uh, this data on, on war being so innate. I suspect that you're overestimating your persuasive powers, but, I but, if, you, but if it makes you feel good to, to think <laughs> that you filled these people with pessimism, go ahead. Well, I realize now that this <clears throat> pessimism is almost, is pretty much universal. I've polled people every opportunity I've had, every time I give a talk, every time I teach a new class at uh, Stevens, I've done this in on-the-street interviews for National Public Radio, um, I've asked people, do you think war will ever end? And about nine people in ten say, no, war will never end. Okay. Um, and I think a lot of that pessimism, not all of it by any means, a lot of it comes out of this kind of vague sense that people have that war is a, a really ancient behavior that is part of human nature somehow. Um, and as a result, it is, it of, is ancient. Pardon me. It is ancient in the literal sense of, of of it was pervasive in ancient times, right? Like Rome. Yes. Well, nobody disputes that. So nobody disputes that war became extremely pervasive and fundamental to uh, to to civilized life. Civilized, and in, in, I guess we should put it in quotes, uh, beginning with the emergence of the first big city states about. Um, about six or seven thousand years ago, and in yeah. fact, there are a lot of uh, social scientists, anthropologists, archaeologists who think that basically the, the state's whole purpose was to kind of organize uh, violence, to suppress violence within the borders of this state, but that but uh, to have a lot of um, organized violence uh, directed outwards. But what yeah. happened? But so what's happened between now and 2003? One of the things that I've done is to look more closely at the, uh, the work of Wrangham and also the claim that war was uh, very pervasive before civilization among humans. And uh, I've concluded that uh, what I sometimes call the deep roots theory of war or the demonic males theory of raw, uh, war is, uh, is just wrong or it's based on very, very flimsy evidence. Okay, can I... I mean, let me get to something you've written recently on this. And first, I should say that for reasons I'll get to, I think in a certain sense this whole debate doesn't matter as far as how how like what are the prospects for getting rid of war. I mean, I mean, uh, but but we'll get to that later. Yeah, that's you, true. You, I, I'd grant that. So we should get back to that. But but first, I have a question. You've written a couple of things on this lately for your uh, blog on Scientific American. Mm -hmm. 
Which seems like a good, which seems like an enviable uh, pedestal to have. I love it. Um, I'm very lucky to have this gig. I just, I hope I can keep it. I, you know, I've written some things that really have made people mad. And uh, that's what you want. Pardon me. That's what you get paid for. That's right. Now, one of the things you you uh, you, uh, you 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 criticize is the claim that okay, one of these these studies of chimpanzee kind of organized aggression, you know, multi male killing of you know other chimpanzees, I guess, you think have been overstated. And and one thing I just have a question about you say somebody somebody named Matani estimates the mortality rate from coalitionary attacks in Kabali to be as high as 2790 per 100,000 individuals per year and then you say but the researchers witnessed only 18 coalitionary or uh, killings now um, my question is are you saying that they did the math wrong in other words if they only saw 18 killings per X number of chim hours of chimpanzee behavior observed, it might be a reasonable extrapolation to say, well, then for 100,000 individuals over how many years, or, or in one year, you would get this many deaths. Right? Are you saying they got their math wrong, I think, or what? No, they didn't do the math wrong. I, the problem I have with, with the way that they often present these numbers is, is that sometimes, so first of all, they're trying to make, when they talk in terms of killings per 100,000 population per year, that's often the way that uh, human homicides are presented. For example, if you're talking mm -hmm. about homicides in uh, New Orleans or Washington, and, and then you're, you're using these really big numbers. And I just think it's really important to point out because, you know, the, the claim that some of these people are making, like Richard Rangham, is, is that this is completely analogous to human, to human violence. I just think it's important to point out, and it was surprising to me to realize it, that the total number mm -hmm. of uh, deaths from these uh, chimpanzee raids that have ever been observed by all the researchers together, and this is something yeah. that I found in, in Rangham's writings, is 31. Okay, but it sounds to me like, like uh, this is the equivalent of saying, um, wait a second, these pollsters are predicting that X number of millions of people will vote for Richard Nixon over George McGovern, but they've only heard from 900 who plan to. This is crazy. This is crazy. That would be a faulty criticism. Well, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's actually worse than that because, again, if you look carefully at the literature, you find that there have been some chimpanzee communities that have never, ever been observed uh, engaging in this kind of lethal rating behavior. Also, mm -hmm. the behavior was only observed for the first time in 1974. That was at Jane Goodall's reservation. Goodall herself, in writing about uh, what started to happen um, at the, uh, this is the Gombe Reservation, mm -hmm. uh, thought that it might be a result of her putting out bananas to try to lure the uh, chimpanzee population into the, this uh, zone that she was uh, observing. And, but didn't she uh, later become a believer in the, in the kind of innate evil of chimpanzees theory, or am I confused? I, I genuinely don't remember, but I thought she moved in that direction. She is, uh, she, I mean, she, she and Rangham, as far as I know, are, are uh, friends. She's never um, accused him of uh, overstating the, uh, the, the idea that human war is innate because this behavior is is seen in, in chimpanzees. When she made this observation about the um, the provisioning of the bananas, that was fairly soon after these observations, af after this lethal behavior was first uh, mm -hmm. seen. There are other anthropologists who have also pointed out that you've got a, a major loss of habitat uh, for chimpanzees in all these areas where they're being observed. Here's, mm -hmm. let, me, let me just give you another statistic that I think bears on the question of whether this behavior um, is innate. Um, and by the way, of the 31 chimpanzee deaths that have been counted among all chimpanzee troops, um, about half of those are infants. So I think it's reasonable to ask whether killing a, a, an infant even should count as, um, as warfare, which is what Rangham is saying. Uh, but, uh, but forget that for a moment. If 
you put all these numbers together and you also count the total number of time that scientists have watched all these different chimpanzee populations, and it comes out to one killing every seven years for your average troop being watched by your average scientist. And so to me, that undercuts the idea of this being a kind of innate compulsive behavior. Also, you put that together with the, um, with the fact that this behavior was only seen beginning in uh, 1974, and there were people who were watching chimpanzees going back to the, uh, the beginning mm -hmm. of the, the 20th uh, uh, century. You had the great anthropologist, primatologist, Yerkes, mm -hmm. who was watching them in, in the early 20th century. Um, and you, you have what, what Jane Goodall herself said about how, how this change in the environment of the chimpanzees might have caused this unusually aggressive behavior. I think we're talking about a cultural innovation among chimpanzees. I don't even okay, think that chimpanzee killing is innate. Of course, it's also possible. I mean, we, we should move on to humans shortly, partly because I think, in a way, the behavior of chimpanzees isn't, you know, we shouldn't overstate the relevance of the behavior. You know, we our lineage diverged from the lineage of chimpanzees. What are they saying now? Six, eight million years ago or something. Right. A long time ago. Clearly, you know, chimpanzees have uh, appreciably more what's called sexual dimorphism than us, right? Mm -hmm. Which is to say the males, the ratio of male size to female size is higher. Right. That is, with, with I think, some confidence by biologists considered an index of the amount of <clears throat> male uh, physical competition there has been largely ultimately over females that you know as, as a as a kind of a sexual resource mm -hmm. so you know I, I mean there's lots of reason to believe we're just not exactly chimpanzees even though they along with bonobos are the two closest living relatives and i know bonobos are less aggressive than chimpanzees and have less sexual dimorphism and are in principle an equally good candidate for analogs to human behavior right. you know i mean that's exactly uh, so so but i would say look given the amount of, of of sexual dimorphism in chimpanzees and a lot of the observed behavior it's certainly not beyond the pale to say that, that chimpanzees can be pretty aggressive both males oh, and they females are. they definitely they, they are and and you know in a way the question of how many killings you've seen in any species including ours is not necessarily the question in other words if a bunch of males uh, human males or human whoever, you know, a bunch of humans raid a village with spears and axes and, the, and, and everyone flees and then they get possession of all the resources in the, in the village. They haven't killed anybody, but you call that, I would call it successful warfare from their point of view, right? Yes, I would. I mean, too. in other words, um, you know, we... we we should distinguish between, you know, killing per se as as uh, as as an instinct and just uh, aggression as an instinct that can lead to killing. Although where I'm ultimately heading is to say that thinking of it in terms of aggressive instincts is really to miss what the big challenge human nature poses us with in, in the realm of war is. Mm -hmm. But. Anyway, I would say all that about chimps and... Let me, let me just make one point about why I think this is important. I sometimes present this data on, on uh, primate, on, on chimpanzees, and there's also some, uh, uh, some data on, on monkeys and, and baboons that's sometimes brought to bear on this question of, of human warfare. It's, the reason I think it's important is because it seems to be a factor in some people's pessimism. And because right. Wrangham has written this popular book, um, Nicholas Wade, the reason I wrote this piece in Scientific American is because there was this uh, piece on the front page of the, um, the Science Times about chimpanzee warfare, and there was this strong implication of its um, relevance to uh, human violence. So I just think it's, it's important to point out how, um, you know, what, what the data really say about about uh, this kind of violence. And by the way, just going back to Lawrence Keeley, what most people don't realize about his book is that he's only describing, yes, he does describe very pervasive violence among the Yanomamo and some other uh, very simple tribal societies um, that we've seen both in modern ethnographic studies and that we can 
can infer from the archaeological record. But the, the violence that he's describing only goes back about eight or 9,000 years at most. The archaeological evidence, you mean? The, arche yeah. the, the archaeological evidence, right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he never really claims that it goes further back than that. Uh, Keeley is not making a claim that human warfare is innate, and in fact, no, he's not. And no, and in fact, the the um, the evidence for uh, human group fighting is very recent. The the oldest, very clear cut evidence. Uh, this is something that I put in my Scientific American piece. Is about uh, thirteen thousand years old. It was a mass grave found in in the uh, Nile Valley. The vast majority of evidence really only begins at different places around the world around uh, 10,000 years ago. So I think, again, that clearly shows that um, warfare, and by warfare, I don't mean just sort of, well, you know, chaotic, anarchic, one-on-one -on -one fighting, but organized uh, raiding only began very recently, and it's well, obviously wait, well, a cultural innovation, and again, not something that is this kind of compulsive, innate behavior. Well... I don't know who's using the word compulsive, but um, and, and I think the word innate is a is kind of a bad word because people tend to think it means compulsive. But um, but anyway, uh, as for whether there was organized aggression, uh, you know, before thirteen thousand years ago or something, I mean, you have to admit that once you get past beyond thirteen thousand, you got a pretty slender database. First of all, just in terms of the number of humans on the planet, That's right? right. There's not that many data points to even look at. But secondly, before that, uh, before 13,000, you know, just about everything there had been in the way of human society was a hunter-gatherer society, right. right? Yes. And so you're talking about very small-scale societies where, you know, of course war in a really conspicuous, and also with, with not very fancy armaments generally, mm -hmm. so war in a, in a sense that would be conspicuous to an archaeologist, right? Right. Yeah, it almost couldn't happen, no, you know? Well, I, well, so actually, I mean, that that's that's probably the most common objection to this idea that, you know, we don't see evidence for war uh, going back that far. But what you have is there are some hunter-gatherer societies, like there there's uh, one in... Uh, the American Southwest, and especially along the, the coast of the uh, Chumash, where you do find evidence of war. And, and the evidence would consist of, you know, the, the best evidence is you find a skeleton with a bunch of uh, arrowheads or, or spearheads still embedded in it. And uh, what, the, what the record actually shows is that um, in some areas you get war appearing uh, at a certain time, and then it comes and goes. It's this... A uh, very sporadic pattern. And well, we know that from looking at human civilization. That's right. It but comes I, and goes. Whole generations go by without participating in war. What I th we know it's possible for people to go a whole lifetime and not be involved in a war. That's not new. Okay, but so you have the, you have the war appearing uh, at, if you just buy this premise for a moment, appearing about <clears throat> 10,000 years ago and, of course, different dates as you move around the world, and then it comes and goes. And what can possibly explain that pattern? Um, maybe it's a certain level of social organization. Maybe it is a certain set of environmental conditions like drought. And there is a, a very strong evidence that uh, drought was associated with outbreaks of violence in the southwest and in places like Chaco Canyon and so forth. But the problem is then there are some places where you get war where uh, there, there wasn't any uh, overpopulation or drought mm -hmm. that might cause a struggle for resources. The pattern is is um, is very uh, unpredictable. So I think okay. that, I think that the best um, theory of war uh, is one that was proposed in 1940 by good old Margaret Mead, who is so vilified by so many of the uh, modern uh, evolutionarily oriented scientists like uh, Richard Rangham and Steve Pinker. So Mead had this famous essay, War is Only and, and, and in the Best. And Mead to, and Mead to some extent I know. as well. Yes, I know. I, 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 spent, I spent much of a chapter on her, but go ahead. I, I mean, I, I've gone back and looked at Mead's writings, and I just think that she is so much smarter and so much more subtle in her thinking than, than she's given credit for. Uh, but anyway, just her, her theory briefly says 
you know, she's sort of going through the different explanations, war coming out of a certain level of, of um, social organization, maybe war just associated with, with uh, city-states and so forth, war being a fight over resources. She said none of these hold up. There are exceptions to all of them. And she said that the very smallest groups, hunter-gatherers, uh, do fight, and they just seem to fight because they have fought. So she's saying that war is an invention. It's something that arises in certain cultures, and then it, it becomes self-perpetuating. So the modern language we would use is that war is a meme. And it's a meme that can perpetuate itself in pretty much any social or environmental conditions. And that, that's what makes it so difficult to come up okay. with, a, okay. with an overall theory of war. Okay, well, here's, uh, I mean, I'd say two things. And again, I'm, I'm going to ultimately say that, you know, the question of war, whether war per se was part of hunter-gatherer society, like the question of how, how uh, aggressive chimpanzees are, is not ultimately that relevant to, to the problem. But it's re Bob, let me say, let me, it's important. It's relevant if people think it's relevant. Well, yeah, but look, on that issue, John, I mean, I'd be careful. If, if you're saying the reason people are pessimistic is because... Uh, they, they, they think that chimpanzees are innately aggressive, and actually the data is much less clear than that, and I'm going to spend all my time talking about that. Well, you could just paint yourself into a corner. could turn out good data does come out, right. and you're wrong, and then, you, you know, I, I just, no, you know, me, then, then your up. side is in trouble. I just think it's a bad, it's a waste of, I think you should, I like to spend my time explaining to people what I think the actual issue is, well, you know, not... I'm not I, I, disabusing a, them of, of notions that may or may not be right that are, in fact, irrelevant to the actual issue anyway. I've got to clear the brush. I'm, got, I'm trying to clear away what I think are bad ideas contributing to people's pessimism. As I said before, there are a lot of people, you know, there's, there's kind of a biological pessimism, and then there are people who completely accept war as primarily cultural, although, you know, of course, biology underpins all of culture. Well, I don't believe it's primarily cultural. Well, That's where I disagree. The idea that it's merely a meme is, 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 I think, gravely misleading. There's where you're doing real disservice to the cause of, of Dovich. I would never is say to, merely a to meme. To try to convince people, it's just this cultural thing. It's like, you know, it's like uh, McDonald's or something, you know. It's like... Uh, I, I, that's just naive. That's just naive to think it's no more deeply seated in human nature than that. War, but, but at the same, war is at the same time, let me say, I'm not talking about war per se being part of human nature. Let me just clarify my position, okay? okay. The, the, first of all, you say, well, if you go back before 13,000 years, there's, not, there's, there's no clear evidence that these hunter-gatherer societies that existed back then we're engaged in war. Well, A, what, what is war in a hunter-gatherer society? As I said, how conspicuous would the remnants be? Of course you could have remnants. I'm just saying the database is so scanty that the absence of evidence is not, as they say, you know, evidence of absence. But C, I just addressed that, Bob, though, that you, you get know, clear C, evidence of, well, of war and then lack of evidence in the, in the same areas. And there are also places that, are, right. that have permanent settlements, that. Neolithic settlements, uh, where you don't have any evidence of war for thousands of years, even while in other areas around the world with similar settlements, you get very clear-cut evidence. I'm just war. saying, I'm just saying, let me just, can I just explain my position? Sure. Okay, yeah. the reason that is irrelevant to the actual problem of war. First, well, first of all, one more tangent, let me just do it and then get to my point. Okay. You say, well, you know, in this, in what I'm saying would be a very scanty database anyway. We don't find war evidence of this ancient hunter-gatherer war. Okay, well, you know what we do have, John, is a very vast database of observed hunter-gatherer societies, mm -hmm. okay, some of which were observed in fairly pristine condition. And there have been various claims to people to have found a non-violent hunter-gatherer society. Remember the gentle Tassidae of the Philippines? Remember the book about the Kung San called The Gentle People? Mm -hmm. You know, these repeatedly turn out to be just wrong. No, okay? no, actually, you're wrong in saying that, Bob. Oh, those, oh, those two claims have held up. Well, first of all, the test today turned out to be a really complicated case. I don't even want to get into that, but well, there, well, there the are guy people presenting them to the West turned out to be a hoaxer. No, but, no, the, the, but you're saying you're saying the Kung San are are, are nonviolent people. They're a good example because they are they are a group that is completely uh, peaceful 
now, but what you, you have uh, some scientists, and this is uh, this is where I think Keeley was um, not dishonest, but I think was overstating his case. There have been periods in the past of the Kung when actually they were quite violent. But the problem I have right. is that then right. then you or Steve Pinker or you know some of the people at Rangham who are arguing that war is innate uh, are saying that because at any point in their past these groups were uh, violent, then that means that therefore hunter-gatherers as a whole must have been violent throughout the Paleolithic going back a couple of million years. What I'm saying that the record shows is that war comes and goes for various reasons. Of course, as I said, that's obvious. Western Europe, generations have come and gone in Western Europe over the last 60 years with no wars. That is obvious, John, that people have the capacity to be peaceful. If that's all you're arguing, it's obvious, you but it's not something that is often acknowledged by people who are making the case that war is analogous to chimpanzee raiding, and that it is okay. this, it's this very uh, biologically driven behavior. I think it's a, an but, important point to point out that that uh, war is. Um, that war is a cultural behavior. And, and believe me, I acknowledge that. To say that that's it's a cultural behavior, again, that's just misleading for the following reason. And here we get to what I think the problem is, okay? You can say, now the Kung San are peaceful. By peaceful, do you mean you never see coalitional aggression among the Kung San, John? Do you mean you never see a group of males go beat the shit out of another male? Is that true? Is that true? I, as far as I know, not any time within the last 40 or 50 years. Oh, within 40 or 50 years, there's never been a group of Kung San males who have beaten up another male? Is that the claim? I'd be really careful if I were you about saying that that's the case, I, John. Because that's not even the case in my neighborhood. I welcome, I welcome any corrections among the Blogging Heads audience, but, uh, but as far as I know, that, that all the claims about the Kung being violent go back either mm -hmm. to the very early 20th century or deep into the 19th century, when there were reports that they were uh, getting in fights with pastoralists who lived around them. Um, Bob, so, wait a second. Bob, this is something that wasn't even true of the junior high school I attended. Was it true of the junior high school you went? Oh, wait, you went to a prep school. Never mind. Nothing personal. Only for one year. But, but, but what? <laughs> Only for one year. Yeah, the, well, but, uh, yeah. Bob, but, listen, but the, um, listen, I want to grant your point. I mean, if you're saying, I think what makes war so pernicious is that it's something that harnesses biological tendencies that are in us. Right. Obviously, male aggression, I recognize it's very real, especially at a, at a young age. The fact that in World War I, you could get millions of young men who were not only... Um, willing, were, but were even eager to go marching off into this absolute carnage. Right. And I, I think that is... And that's harnessing part of human nature. To say it's yes. just cultural is to really understate the challenge. I'm not saying... I mean, you I, don't want to get people unduly pessimistic, but to say, oh, humans are innately peaceful, and then this weird meme comes in, that's just so wrong. I, and I'm, so not, I'm not saying wrong. it's just... Just cultural. Here, let me let me try to grant your point by bringing in another set of data, which I think is much more worrisome even than innate, especially young male aggression. It's the um, the kind of social psychology research that you get from people like Stanley Milgram and uh, Philip Zimbardo, these guys who did these experiments back in the 60s and 70s, that show how easy it is to get people to uh, perform horrific acts if they if there's a an authority figure uh, telling them to do so so Milgram's uh, experiments I'm sure everybody knows about them by now but these are the experiments where he got people they thought they were involved in a memory test with another subject and uh, when that subject gets gets an answer wrong um, the real research subject has to give them an electric shock which of course wasn't real the person in the room other room was an actor but a majority of people, about two-thirds, um, gave a maximum shock that they thought was life-threatening to another person. A lot of these, a lot of the uh, subjects were very distressed when they were doing this, but they still did it. So I, this, to me, is, you could say this is genetic behavior, and I think there's a good case to be made for it, that, that um, we're innately uh, conformist. We defer to the values of... Um, 
of our culture. So I think you put that together with, uh, with yes, I'll say innate, especially male aggression, although females can be pretty damn aggressive as well, and, and you get this incredibly pernicious um, meme, war meme. And right. Another thing that makes it pernicious is that you, can, you can't choose to be pacifist. There's some cultural behaviors that one society can have it, and it doesn't necessarily affect the society next to it. If you've got one warlike society surrounded by ten peaceful societies, uh, all those peaceful societies around it are, are going to have to become warlike as well to defend themselves against the the one aggressive warlike society. So, there, so war really is um, it, it, it's like the worst kind contagious. of contagious. Pardon me, but it's contagious. But yes. but but yeah. But but well, I think you're 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 you're, you're you're getting at, you know, part of the way I view it when you start talking about these various specific behaviors like submission to authority under certain circumstances. My view is that there are various parts of human nature that kind of conspire to make war an easy thing to happen, mm -hmm. even though many of them evolved in a context in which war in the modern sense of the term was either unlikely or not even possible, okay? Right. So, like, to me... It doesn't matter whether uh, coalitional aggression, uh, you know, when it was, when the psychological mechanisms that support it were evolving, whether they were evolving in a context of we, what we would call war, you know. Okay, so maybe it was just three guys in a hunter-gatherer society teaming up against three guys in the same village and having a fight. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and maybe it only rarely became lethal. Fine. But, but it still is the fact that these psychological mechanisms that support this kind of thing evolved, and I believe they're very subtle, and that's why I think even terms like aggression are misleading in terms of the magnitude of the challenge. Um, and I think you and I exhibit, we, we indulge every day the psychological mechanisms that are conducive to war. And I'll, I'll just give you an example. is When you or I, when you decide that the Richard Wranghams of the world are wrong, you know, there's a subtle part of your mind, you won't admit this being you, but you'll just have to take my word, word for this analysis of you, John. Um, there's, a subtle, there's, there's a part of you that is starting to say, they're, you know, they're the guys I'm fighting, and damn it, I'm going to prove they're wrong. And it starts skewing your vision. I don't mean yours any more than mine. I do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure, let's leave you and me aside. I'm sure you've, you've witnessed this in academia, right? Well, These of coalitions. course I grant this. I'm of an course. aggressive, competitive okay. person. I know that. Okay, so, so my, my point is that... So there were a lot of pacifists. So was Gandhi. Right. So, so my, but yeah, but it isn't just aggressive. It, it, it's the subtle ways that we put groups of people in a category that's different from, from our allies and how that starts skewing our perception of them. I'm just saying that I'm convinced, absolutely convinced, that this part of human nature and a lot of other parts are the ingredients of war. It doesn't matter to me whether they, they were giving rise to war per se uh, 20,000 years ago, I'm, I'm quite sure that some of them were, in, were involved in coalitional violence 20,000 years ago, but that's another um, question. Yeah, but, but, but I have the point to say is, that, but go ahead. But the point is um, that uh, to, to under, you know, it, it isn't just that war has a grounding in human nature. I look, as you said, I believe war can be eradicated. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 I, um, and I've been writing this, but but it does have a grounding in human nature that is both deep and subtle, and I think it, it, you're not helping the cause uh, if all you know if you spend all your time trying to disabuse people of the notion that it does have a grounding in human nature. Uh, well, I'm I'm I can't stand it when people believe things that are based on little or no evidence or just are flat out wrong. I mean, that's one of the things that I love doing as a science journalist is just pointing out. Uh, areas where where people where, where something has be, uh, become uh, received wisdom, and it just turns out uh, not to be the case. So that's important to me, also because some people do have this argument that war is is in some cases uh, 
an outgrowth of human nature and therefore, and we've always fought and therefore we will always fight. Um, you know, I feel it's important to take that on, but believe me, that's not, I, I realize that, um, I'm, I realize the pitfalls uh, of that kind of approach because yes, maybe there could be some evidence of, you know, we could find, uh, suddenly find all these fossil uh, graves with evidence of warfare going way back into uh, the Paleolithic. Oh, does that mean that war is inevitable? Um, that's why I have to address the uh, all Look, the the yeah. cultural uh, some of the the cultural problems that combined with these biological tendencies uh, do what make war so deep rooted in uh, modern culture. But then I, I you know I admit that I'm I'm trying to present as optimistic an argument as possible because I think our beliefs are to a certain extent um, self-fulfilling. So just before we, you know, we, we end this argument, I want to point out one of the common objections to uh, what I'm saying. So you, you probably know that we happen to be in a period of uh, relative peace, especially compared to the 20th century. So over the last 10, 20 years, there's been a really remarkable decline in international war and even in civil wars both in terms of the number of wars and uh, the number of casualties. Well, isn't it more, isn't it more like uh, 50 or 60 years, in, 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 you know, in, in historical terms? Well, I mean, certainly the civil it's been 60 years since there has been war among great powers, right. whereas for much of history that was just an everyday occurrence. That, that's right. It was like every 10 years, you know. Not many years passed between World War One and World War Two. Right. I, so I'm, I'm glad you're aware of that. I just, so I want to point out one of the... so. I think this is a really exciting period. There are some scholars who are saying maybe we're seeing the beginning of the end of, of at least uh, classic international war. There's a blogging heads, uh, a former blogging heads guest named John Mueller who's made this, uh, who, who, is, who has been tracking this trend and is, is, has a very optimistic picture of, of the future. One of the objections, and I got this from a military historian who actually used to be the right-hand man of General Petraeus, is a guy named Mansoor who I met at a conference at Ohio State earlier in the summer. And uh, you know, I talked about the decline in war casualties in war. And he goes, yeah, 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 1910. I'm saying, you know, what, 1910? He goes, he said, in the early 20th century, there were people who were getting very excited about the long period of little or no yeah, war in Europe. And, Nor and Norman Angel's book and everything else, right. I heard this. Okay, so he said, I think this period could be just like that. Then suddenly war, World War I broke out. So what is different from from our period uh, and that period? And First of all, it had not been 50 years since a war involving great a great power back in 1910. But uh, but secondly, I mean, my view is, you know, you said that I have myself predicted end of war, kumbaya, etc. When I talked about this in my book Non-Zero and elsewhere, I was careful to say a. I think more than ever it's plausible that you'll see an end to war among nation states over time. But B, there is an emerging threat that will be the great threat of our time if, if war is not, and that is war involving non-state actors. Right. So, uh, you know, as, as even if, as I think, you know, can, can well happen, the world becomes more and more, uh, you know, more and more reaches kind of a global level of social, social organization where the great powers agree that, yeah, we've got to get along. I think you will see uh, very dangerous, uh, you know, lethal activity involving non-state actors of the sort that we've seen in 9/11 and since. And by the way, in, in that sense, I think you're almost um, your focus is almost wrong. I don't think the great challenge of our time right now in America is to go and convince people we can end war. We can end war. I mean, we're going to end these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. The great threat to our society in the world is. The way politicians are revving up this this irrational fear of Muslims, okay, mm -hmm. and, and and here they're, they're invoking the very same impulses that in another context might support war per se, right. but in this case they could lead to the fracturing of America, to to civil strife, and uh, well, and it wouldn't only be civil; it would have this international component. Um, so I, I think. Um, Wait a minute. So you're anyway, granting, that's what I think. you're granting that? Are you actually saying that the 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 end of international war is 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 a given and, and is is no, not I'm even not that big a deal? A given. I'm not saying it's a given. I'm saying that more than ever, 
it's plausible that the great powers could never ever go to war again. Uh, and, and that war among nation states could become a thing of the past. I wrote, I wrote this piece for the New York Times Magazine. Uh, right, okay, but... Whatever, but... But, but Bob, I'm, don't I'm you think saying, that's... No, I'm not saying it's a given. I'm saying that even if it happens, we're going to face this, this very serious threat of non-state actors eventually possessing weapons of mass destruction, and, and, and you know, the, the kind of thing we're seeing now is potentially a, a harbinger of that. And I think that's kind of the... Uh, I mean, both of them are grave threats worthy of... of of serious consideration, but I mean, okay. if I had to, I, you know, if I had to w ask what's at the top of my agenda, it's it's keeping Americans from getting hysterical about the possible presence of jihadists in their midst. Absolutely, you know, not an attack from another country. I agree, but let, let me just, I, I just wanted to point out a couple of, um, I just wanted to respond, I think some people out there will find it extraordinary that we're even talking about the, the possibility of ending international war. And believe me, I think most people, uh, my, my, this, the discussions that I've had with people over the last six or seven years uh, lead me to think that the vast majority of people out there find that completely implausible, just the end of, of uh, international war. That was what I was getting from this guy, Peter Mansour, at this military uh, history conference. I pulled everybody else there. Nobody thought that war... Um, was going to end. Uh, there, a lot of them were making the analogy with 1910. The big difference between now and 1910, just addressing international war, is that uh, most nations in the world now are at least quasi-democratic. And you've got this democratic peace phenomenon of democracies. Yes, they do fight non-democracies, but they rarely, if ever, fight each other. You also get the uh, rise in uh, media, which is uh, given us a picture of the war, of war and violence that's more graphic than anything we've uh, seen before. It also promotes uh, sort of cross-cultural understanding, although it also can promote um, hateful ideologies, if, as uh, you've written about. Um, you have rising prosperity, even though we're, we're going a little bit backwards at the moment, but rising prosperity, even though I think you can't connect war too closely with resource struggles, but um, as people, as the standard of living rises around the world, and it is, um, then I think a certain kind of war, a kind of Malthusian war, becomes less likely. Now, if you're mm -hmm. talking about, yeah, Al-Qaeda, apocalyptic, crazy, religious cults, I think it's, we've made tremendous progress if uh, uh, stable I think, I states... Think... I don't agree with that characterization of the problem, that it's crazy religious people, but go ahead. Well, I'm just saying that, that I'm looking for any progress that I can find, and if we're at the point where, where we can rule out, let's say, war between the United States and, uh, and China or Mexico or, or Pac even Pakistan and India, my God, that is just that's tremendous. And then you can also talk about uh, scaling down armies, militaries around the world, um, that are commensurate, commensurate with the new threat, which would be, I don't know, drug gangs, Al-Qaeda, these religious uh, uh, apocalyptic cults, uh, and that sort of thing. And I see that as something that I would hope can be combated on a kind of um, police level. Not, mm -hmm. not having aircraft carriers and, uh, and intercontinental bombers and, and nuclear missiles and all that sort of thing. So it just means that there's a lot more money that can be taken out of militaries and put into other areas where you're also decreasing um, violence by promoting education and uh, building infrastructure and spreading peace and prosperity around the world. Yeah, the, I mean, the one thing I think you didn't mention that I would really emphasize is just the degree of economic interdependence among the great powers, you know, I, I think if you ask why is war not conceivable among Western European nations when in fact that had been, much of history had been France fighting Germany, one reason is just, you know, uh, there's pervasive economic interdependence, the business elites know it, and in combination with something I think you did allude to, they know each other more than they did right. in the past. I mean, you know, Chamberlain, but I think it was a Chamberlain who before World War II called Oh, uh, where would it have been? It wasn't. It was Czechoslovakia, probably. Uh, he referred to the trouble there. 
as, you know, a, land, a faraway land about which we know little or something. Well, right. no, no Western European would think of Czechoslovakia that way now, there's a, or, or the Czech Republic. There's, there's more economic interdependence, but plus it just seems closer. Well, you know, you know more, the problem with, more business. The problem with the economic interdependence is that, so you mentioned Norman Angell before. Angell had this huge bestseller in the early 20th century where he, he didn't say, some people said he was predicting right. war would end. What he was saying, he didn't predict it. He, what he said was, it would be crazy for right. there to be a war. It would be totally irrational because the great European powers have so much more to gain through uh, trade and, as you might put it, non zero sum interactions. It's just none of these leaders would be so insane as to uh, go to war over anything. There wouldn't be anything worth it. And yet they did. So that's why I think right. pinning. War on the hopes of I don't know globalization right. and trade alone isn't enough. That's why I'm so yeah, yeah. But the two things that have in fact grown are the degree of economic interdependence and the actual personal acquaintance between the business elites and the different nations. Yes. I mean, I was in China this summer, and the Chinese tour guide explained to me that China's fate is so intertwined with the rest of the world mm -hmm. economically and in other ways that you know you just can't think of them of it as a zero sum game. Um, let me let me just but, ask you uh, this: if, if you buy, you know, the the reason I like thinking about war as a kind of meme is that then it it really matters what we think about war, what popular conceptions are of of war, and it seems to me that another difference between now and nine and nineteen ten is that we've had two world wars that just rub in our faces the insanity of war and how um, and how destructive. They are for everybody, for for uh, civilians as well as as the actual uh, fighters, and and what John Mueller I mentioned before has said uh, this is done is that there's just um, you know you actually had people talking about war a hundred years ago some people as as something um, that actually was somehow beneficial it kind of invigorated societies really there are very few respectable. Uh, intellectuals uh, or leaders who talk in those terms today. Uh, war is talked about as a necessary evil in general, uh, but most people at least pay lip service to the idea of war um, being eradicated some someday. Uh, and I, I think yeah. that kind of cultural sea change is tremendously important also, and, and another one of the reasons why I think we can talk reasonably about the end of war. Oh, I, we agree. On that note, we agree. Um, the uh, we're really we have? total sync on this, Bob. I know right. that because we are competitive, uh, aggressive primates, we have to argue about it. But I think everybody out there in Blogging Heads land can see that underneath, we're just just in total sync. Kumbaya, Lord. <laughs> um, Let's see, where should we go? Well, you know, there's not unrelatedly, <laughs> there's, your, there's your historical dissing of uh, Buddhism. Yeah. Uh, let me just say, you know, I just went on a, a one-week meditation retreat this summer, and uh, uh, I, what I would say is that at the end of one of these retreats, I think when they work for you, you are in a frame of mind such that if everyone were in that frame of mind, there would be no more wars. And, yeah. and the reason is you have detached, you've gained a measure of detachment with respect to all these parts of human nature I'm talking about that are subtly conducive to war. Mm -hmm. But I know that you think Buddhism is some kind of uh, sham or something. No, I, that's too strong. I, I, I mean, I've, I've dabbled in Buddhism and meditation various times, and I... I I think I've told you, I feel that uh, I could benefit from meditation. I think it's made you a nicer person, Bob. And, um, you know, I could probably um, use some of that. I, I, I guess some of the claims being made for Buddhism and, and meditation, I, I find um, just exaggerated, and, and some are even... Uh, yeah, but on the other hand, you gravitate, for purposes of your journalism, you gravitate toward the people who are making the most extreme claims so that it's easier to ridicule the whole enterprise, right? I mean, no, I'm, I, you know. what I'm looking at is some of the most famous uh, Buddhist leaders who have come from the East to the West 
and have popularized Buddhism here. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's actually more fair when you're talking about some of these spiritual disciplines to look at the behavior of the, the major proponents. So, you know, you can have a scientist who's an actual a, absolute scumbag, and that doesn't have anything to do with his theory. But if you have a Buddhist leader who is an alcoholic and a bully, physical bully, and is, and is married but is having sex with people uh, left and right, um, and this describes this guy, uh, Trungpa, uh, who helped to found the Naropa Institute and is still considered one of the greatest Buddhist thinkers of the modern age. Um, I think it's significant that this guy was just a raging asshole. I mean, almost like yeah, but a you do, you do gravitate You do gravitate toward these people, I'm saying. I mean, you know, uh, why don't you do Thich Nhat Hanh or whatever his name is instead yes. of, you know, I mean, uh, you know, he has a huge following. Now, maybe there's some skeletons in his closet, but I don't know of any. And, and this place I was at, uh, the Insight Meditation Society, they make a point of not, not using the trappings of authority. You know, the teachers don't wear special robes. And the, the, it's very secular. Um, uh, and I think they're really good people who run it, and uh, and it does good. And, and it's one of the major, you know, maybe the major Vipassana retreat center in America. Um, I th so I think that the the recent movement and in, in, uh, in kind of westernized Eastern mysticism, Hinduism, and, and Buddhism away from the old guru system, where you right. became enlightened by really worshiping. Uh, another person who was so supposedly enlightened is a really good thing. Also, as far as I can tell, there seems to be a kind of de-emphasis on enlightenment, on this kind of end state that some people achieve that is supposed to be almost miraculous in the benefits that right. it confers. That's not what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I'm talking about more modest goals. The other thing is I shouldn't even use the term Buddhism because what's happening in America now I, you know, is, is very unlike what Buddhism is like for most Buddhist adherents in, in, in Asia. First of all, they don't meditate. The lay people don't meditate by and large and so on. But the kind of secularized, so-called Buddhist meditation, I'm talking about a, mo uh, you know, a, a form of it with modest aspirations, not attaining ultimate enlightenment. Although I do think if you spend weeks and weeks in isolated meditation, you can go to some pretty interesting places. But I think as a practical matter, you're looking for some degree of detachment from the parts of human nature that ordinarily warp our vision. Right. I, I agree with that. I, again, it's, you know, I, there's such a big difference between, between the, the kind of denatured Buddhism that, that is taught here and that I think you're attracted to and, um, you know, the real Buddhism as the vast majority of Buddhists uh, practice it um, back in the East. Uh, and, and also what, uh, what bothers me is that there is this, you know, now there are these supposedly scientific studies done by uh, Richie Davidson and others on, on uh, the benefits you can get from meditation. And there's this monk mm -hmm. that Davidson has studied. Um, he's got a French name, Richou or something like that. I've heard about him, yes. Yeah, and who supposedly is the happiest person on the planet, according to his, his uh, brain waves. But... To me, you know, if you're talking about a discipline that supposedly makes you a better person and improves your relations with others and fills you with compassion and so forth, I think it's important to remember that Buddhism still exalts, the leader of Tibetan Buddhism it is a celibate monk. Buddhism still exalts this idea of social isolation in many cases and sort of going off into the wilderness and meditating in a cave or or whatever. Well, not, for not, the monks, it, but that's only a way of life for the monks. But the, but that's that, not the prescription. But as in, I'm just talking about sort of the, um, you know, the values that are at least implied by these yeah. systems. That Tibetan Buddhism, very much like Catholicism, has at the at its its pinnacle uh, a celibate monk, and I I just think yeah. that that's, you know, so I, I don't think that's I don't think that's necessary. Right. Well, it may I'm work sometimes, and, and and there may be people who, you know, it's interesting to have as as a kind of inspiration someone who's so completely divorced themselves from from ordinary human nature that they just are above it all. If that's the case, but as you know, half the time they wind up that winds up not being the true case. Right. <laughs> but 
But, but let me, you know, we're, we're at an hour now, and I don't know if this is going to run as a science Saturday, but I did want to say a word about George Williams, whom oh, I right. discovered only this morning died this week. Yes. Um, he is a, uh, you know, he was a biologist um, and is one of the really unjustly unsung heroes of, uh, of modern evolutionary biology. Um, his kind of footprints are everywhere in the field of, certainly in the field of evolutionary psychology, um, he, uh, you know, if you look at the big foundational theories of evolutionary psychology, the, the so-called theory of parental investment, which is kind of a misnomer, but that's, that's Robert Trivers' uh, theory. And the other thing uh, uh, commonly associated with Trivers is uh, theory of reciprocal altruism. Both of those, as Trivers himself acknowledges, the, the seeds of those can be found in, in Williams' 1966 book, Adaptation and, and Natural Selection. For that matter, if you look at the beginning of Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene, he credits that book because, indeed, uh, maybe the book could be 68 instead of 66, I'm not sure, but uh, because, indeed, large parts of, of, of The Selfish Gene are, in a way, popularization, all the very good popularization, of, uh, of George Williams' worldview. Right. And... Um, you know, George, it was, adaptation and natural selection was a very strong individual selectionist manifesto. Um, whatever the outcome of the, of the, of the long-term dialectic between individual selectionists and group selectionists, the book was very fertile as a very clear statement of the problems with group selection. And I think almost everyone acknowledges that many of the problems George identified were problems, um, mm -hmm. regardless of... of, of uh, of the outcome of the debate, and, and my money is still on, on the main story being individual selection, but um, in a meaningful sense. Yeah. But finally, he was a, a wonderful human being. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if everyone was George Williams, there would be no wars. <laughs> I mean, uh, really, he was just the sweetest guy. Yeah. Um, we, uh, in a field actually, with some real big bruising egos. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I noticed that on the Edge website, Trivers tells a story about how he sent Williams a manuscript and said, you know, I realized only too late that some of these ideas are yours. And George didn't even mention it. You know, he didn't, didn't, uh, that's the kind of guy he was. It's the reason he was an unsung hero to, 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 the, to the popular audience. But you could argue that more than any single person, um, even William Hamilton, who did Ken Selection, uh, I, I, as I recall, told me that, uh, you know, I, I think George had said things that helped stimulate him in the theory of, of, of kin selection, even though I don't think George uh, quite got it. But, uh, but, but, but Hamilton used to emphasize how George had been in on the fundamentals in all of these areas. And, uh, you know, I once um, was putting together a documentary that never has seen the light of day. I still have several hours of uh, footage of George Williams. And we were late, uh, this is a long, this is like almost 20 years ago, we were late getting to his house because we had screwed up, and he was just incredibly gracious, gave us as much time as we wanted, even though I think it meant uh, his wife was kind of uh, uh, trying to get him to move on to more important stuff, but um, really was a wonderful human being. Yeah, oh, that's really nicely said, Bob. I, you know, I, I met him at that conference that I went to, I guess, in the mid-90s, the HBES uh, conference and interviewed him for an article that I wrote and uh, yeah he I, I feel lucky just to have had that that uh, brief encounter with him because he was you know he had this sort of combination of obviously like a like a steely uh, really rigorous tough intellect and a very right. a little bit like um, Ed Wilson uh, you know very gracious and uh, and kind of gentle manner so but uh, but less I would say, you know, I love Ed Wilson, but less intent on being a player than Ed Wilson. Yes. I mean, uh, look, I'd like to be a player. Nothing wrong with wanting to be a player, but George was just the most humble, truly self-effacing uh, people. And speaking of HBS, I, I just remember, uh, just to, to tie this all together and bring some Buddhism in, um, I remember... Uh, during one of those, he was talking about how he didn't know how he was going to get to the airport. And I said, well, I've got a plane leaving about an hour later. I've got to return this rental car. I can just drive you there. And he said, that would be a nirvana-like solution. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Very nice. Um,
And, uh, and I was remember feeling so lucky that I was going to get to spend the car ride talking to him. Yeah. Um, it was just, uh, that is how much reverence he deserves. Very nice um, eulogy, Bob. It's all true. If, if everyone were like him, there would be no wars. Yeah. If everyone were like you, John, on the other hand. Or even worse, like you, Bob. <laughs> well, then, then God I would help just give us. up. Then I would give up. Um, okay, well, this was good. Uh, and uh, let's do it. Let's do it again. Even if we have to, having exhausted the, uh, having having laid out the solution to war, uh, even if we have to talk about other things late next time. We're in sync, Bob. We're in sync. Okay. All right. Kumbaya, man. Take it easy.